Welcome to the very first edition of Devil's Debate. We hope you have a, had a wild Tuesday as we have had here at ASUDevils.com. I'm Dominic Catroni, a current Walter Cronkite student. Here at ASU, I'm a part of the Walter Cronkite Sports Network. I've covered ASU football, ASU basketball, ASU baseball especially, as well as ASU hockey and a bunch of other sports, and I'm joined by my co-host here. Uh, I'm Fabio Nardaya. I'm the assistant sports editor at the State Press. Uh, I've covered hockey as part of the State Press. I've also covered ASU football, basketball, baseball, and a number of sports, and I'm really looking forward to this new show. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. If This is obviously our first time, so you don't know what to expect, but here's what we're going to tell you to do. Just sit back, relax. We've got the sidebar of everything that we're going to talk about today. So make sure that if you see something you like, stay tuned. Maybe you'll learn something new about something you didn't know already. But we're going to try to bring our best insight into ASU Athletics of what we know and the hot topics of today. So let's jump right in it. And there's no other place to start. Herb Sendak, the day of reckoning has come for him. He is finally fired as head coach of ASU basketball after nine seasons at the helm. Fabian, this has been a long time coming, and now it's actually happening. So... What do ASU fans have to look forward to? Well, I think people saw this sort of coming. It was an up and down year, to say the least. They had the win against U of A, which many people thought was going to save his job, but then that loss against USC in the first round of the Pac-12 tournament, and then not getting to that 20-win plateau this season to get the contract extension. You saw it sort of coming. Fans were wishy-washy on their opinions on Herb Sendek. I think it's time to really make a change. and. Ray Anderson really addressed that today. What I love, though, is everybody's pouring out the, the support for Herb, saying that he was a great man, and everybody agrees on that in the media, and everyone who's been around Herb understands he is a man with class, he carries himself at a high level, but he doesn't bring that high, same high level onto the court, and at the end of the day, Ray Anderson wants you know division championships, he wants Pac-12 championships, he wants good showings, and after the 42-point blowout loss at Utah, granted they're a very good team in Utah, the reports are saying that's when it started to, to escalate. Maybe this is the finally the end. And then others reports said that it was the USC loss in the Pac-12 tournament, the 12 seed, a 21-4 run to end the game for the Trojans, just not acceptable. And that was also the first time ever the 12 seed has even won a game in the Pac-12 tournament. And just it's time really to dedicate themselves to that basketball program. I think Herb Sendek wanted some of that. He really was a pioneer in helping the 942 crew emerge that are trying to get student involvement there, but I think money is something that needs backing here. The average number, the average salary of a coach in the Sweet 16 right now is $3.3 million a year. They need to start spending money on, on their next coach, whoever he is, and try to spend also money on Sun Devil State, not Sun Devil State, on Wells Fargo Arena renovations and try to get that up to par. And they're also going to owe him $2.4 million in a buyout because he just signed that extension as well. Yeah, it's almost as much as Kirk Cotter, uh, Dirk Cotter got uh, when he, he was bought out as head football coach. Yeah, exactly. And now, speaking of replacements for Herb Sendek, there's lots of options out there, lots of names being thrown out there, but Jeff Capel is the name that's really starting to stand out as the top target for Arizona State, the assistant head coach, the associate head coach right now at Duke University. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because Capel, he's a guy that there's reports saying that it's his if he wants it. That's really soon for the only name that's really been seriously thrown around. Everyone's talked about Archie Miller. Okay, take a step back. Archie Miller is not going to come to Tempe, and here's why. He has said on the record that he does not want to coach and recruit against his brother down in U of A. Who wants to do that, first of all, against Sean Miller? Second of all, Dayton just made it to the uh, second round for the back-to-back -back years, and then last year I think they went to the Sweet 16 as yeah, well. They did. Just had a heartbreaking loss to OU. There's no reason for him to leave the, the Flyers out there. Also, you look at what you know Archie has done there. There's no reason for him to leave, but Capel is interesting because he's also had some tournament experience. But in my eyes, he's almost an identical Herb Sendek. Well, yeah, basically both coaches have relied on a superstar. Just get one giant to, get, yeah. To rely, to have their success. Uh, Herb Sendak got James Harden, and Capel got Blake Griffin. And that's basically the extent of their success at their respective schools. And Cable, although he was cleared of any wrongdoing and they still yeah. an investigation, he sort of has that background and history of issues with the NCAA when he was head coach at Oklahoma. I don't really know if that's really want the image you want to have with the program. He's a great coach, and I think anyone that... Mike Krzyzewski is willing to bring on a Duke is capable of being a decent coach. We've seen, well, the jury saw on Waj at uh, Marquette, but I feel like anyone that Coach K brings in will be 
incredible, but still, you have to look at all the options. He was the youngest head coach at NCAA level back in 2002 when he was only 27 years old and was the head coach of Virginia Commonwealth. He seems to be the leader in the clubhouse right now. They look at two other candidates that we put here on ASUDevils.com. Josh Passner, a Wildcat. Hang on. Whoa. You can't, you can't have a Wildcat. Yeah, you can. He knows what he's doing. He won the 1997 National Championship with the Cats. He's coached under Lute Olsen and coached and played for Lute Olsen. He knows a thing or two about coaching, I think, that Olsen guy. And then also, you look at it, he's got 125 wins in his first five seasons as a head coach at Memphis. That's not a great place to leave either, but they missed the tournament this year, and he was some tried to ignite a fire underneath him, saying, oh, they should have made the tournament this year. Well, he's an Arizona guy, and that actually comes in handy when it comes to recruiting, because he knows the area, he's recruited the area. There's lots of kids in this area that are leaving, and you just saw Marcus... Howard decommit from ASU. So if you want to try to get these local kids, you can't help but choose from a good program like U of A. Arizona has a great program. So of course you're going to have great alum. So I feel like Pastor is a good option. I think he's done a decent job with that Memphis program, although he hasn't quite had the talent that John Calipari recruited there. Mm -hmm. But I feel like he's done a decent job. I feel like he would bring energy to the Sun Devils that's been missing for a while. The other name that we have here on ASUDevils.com is Steve Lavin, the head coach at St. John's. Now, this one kind of took me back. An East Coast guy, you think, but he spent five seasons now at St. John's. He previously spent seven years at UCLA, so he knows the West Coast well enough. He knows Pac-10 basketball at the time. Now Pac-12, obviously. UCLA has been kind of up and down and since he has been gone, but still... That's an interesting name. What do you think about that, though? Um, Big East has been a different, difficult conference, really, to sort of get a gauge on. You see Villanova, a school that dominates the Big East year after year the last couple of years, ever since they transitioned, but yet they struggle in the NCAA tournament. You see these Big East schools that put up big-time numbers but don't really perform in the tournament. I don't know if that packed previous con uh, conference experience here would really play over at ASU if he wasn't able to get the recruits he'd be able to get at UCLA. Well, you can check out that article right here. We put it on the screen for you. Click that, check it out. But now we move on. Let's talk about some football now. It's been a lot of basketball today. Let's talk about a little bit of football. Practice, spring practice going on right now. One of the most notable guys here is Brady White. Came in early. He's one of the trying to compete for the quarterback spot at the end of next season when Berkovici is gone. What about, what, what, what's he got to do? What's he been doing lately at practice? Well, it's not often you see you're, that you're talking a lot about a guy who probably won't even play a single down this season, but that just shows how promising this future is. The quarterback situation coming into next season is going to be one of the most interesting storylines you'll see in the country because you have Brady White, Manny Wilkins, Colton Gearhart, and Bryce Perkins who will be coming this fall all competing for that starting quarterback job. And they so far, they've all had great reviews. Manny Wilkins looked great today. He had a couple great touch passes, a couple touchdown passes. Brady White has been the story of the spring, just with his talent coming out as an early enrollee from high school, able to grasp that Mike Norvell offense and really take control. And just Mike Berkovici called him a, basically a 2.0 version of himself. Reminds him a lot of himself, very cerebral quarterback, and uses those physical tools to the best visibility. So is he ahead of Wilkins at this point then, come next year's depth chart already? Um, I'm, It's difficult to say, because Wilkins came in with a lot of hype last year. A lot? A, 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 a bunch of hype. He brought in recruits for he, for ASU. He was huge, so if, if he's not happy, that could be very interesting to see how that unfolds. Well... I feel like the way this plays out is someone's going to have to transfer or switch positions at some point. Uh, Colin Gerhardt's not playing this spring because he's currently playing on the diamond instead of on the football field. So it'll be interesting to see how he plays into that backup quarterback race come the fall. Depending on how those situations play out, I don't know how Manny Wilkins sits in that role. It's, it's going to change a lot the next two years. And I don't know if he be if he does get beat off the starting job, if he'd be willing to switch positions, because he's a great athlete with great size. I guess, I guess. That all makes sense. We'll have to see how everything goes. Yeah, it's just two years from now, but it's still a great thing to debate now. It's a great thing that's interesting to look at, especially the beginning of this quarterback battle. But now I kind of want to go back to the hardwood, because there is a, a basketball coach at ASU that's doing really well. She's been here, she's been at the program for a while, and now the ASU women's basketball team is made it to the Sweet 16. A crazy comeback win last night, though, against Arkansas Little Rock, ending the game on 24 to 8 run. And now they're going to the Sweet 16 against Florida State. What have your thoughts been on just like how this tournament run has been, how the season has gone for a program that has been good, but it has not been this great 
really under Charlie Turner Thorne. It's the same as men's where they were underestimated in the polls. Remember men's were finished, I think, ninth or picked to finish ninth in the uh, Pac-12. Yeah. They finished fifth. This year, same thing happened with women's basketball. They were picked seventh and sixth in the, in the coaches and the media poll, respectively. They ended up finishing second. So they are overwhelming expectations. Last year, they were in a similar position, but they didn't get the host regional. They ended up losing to eventual runner-up Notre Dame. So they're lucky that they don't have to face a one seed, but they get ready to face Florida State. Florida State's very difficult, coming from the ACC, obviously. A really good squad. They've battle-tested against South Carolina, one of the best teams as well, coming from the SEC. They're one of the number one seeds as well. Hopefully, ASU will have to miss out on them until they get to the Elite Eight matchup. They have to win that game first. But this team... They had that slow first half again, shooting under 30% from the floor, and that just can't happen against Florida State. You have to make sure that you knock some shots down but keep the high-quality stuff down low. Bruner had 70 po 17 points. Amukamara had 17 points. But the Alicia Davis Circus 3 with the shot clock expiring, yeah. that's the shot, shot of the year already. I think that's like the one shining moment of the women's basketball tournament so far this year. Amukamara basically carried that team that first half. It was If it wasn't for her, they would... Had nine, they would have been run off the floor. Yep. But then Alicia Davis, that crazy shot. Yep. You sometimes you have to get lucky in the tournament. Crazy stuff happens in March, and crazy shots have to happen for certain teams to compete. And you've seen that this year. You saw R.J. Hunter make that crazy shot in the men's tournament to advance, to, for Georgia State to advance. So lots of crazy stuff has to happen. But it was a great shot, great play, and ASU is playing the Sweet 16. That's fun to watch, and we'll have to watch out for them coming next Friday. Coming, it'll be on ESPN Family Networks. Now we move back to the football field. Cam Smith, we all know about his injury at this point. He'll be missing due to knee surgery. He missed the end of last season, of course, too. But you look at it, he leaves a void. Now there's two big voids left in the ASU wide receiving core. Obviously strong. We've all talked about him a million times over. Not many are talking about Smith's replacements. Who do you think is going to step up in that regard? I think the guy who's going to step up has already probably stepped up and probably based off of his spring might have actually passed Smith ha had Smith been ready to go for fall camp and it's DJ Foster. I think DJ Foster is going to play that role Smith played last year. Sort of that speedy wide receiver who can make the play with, as a deep threat but also make the play on a short pass and take it all the way. That strong role is already going to be taken by someone else and I think the front runner for that has been Ellis Jefferson. He's exactly. had a great spring. And Mike Berkovici raved about him when I talked to him last week saying that he's got great size, great wingspan, and of course he might be a little bit biased, granted he's his roommate, but <laughs> still, it, Ellis Jefferson has had a great spring, I think he has a chance to really make some plays. The guy who I'm looking at so far this spring, and has started off well, but Coach Graham said he's plateaued in the last couple days, is Eric Lauderdale. Came in last year as a Juco transfer, sort of struggled a bit to adapt to that Norvell offense early on, but I think this is the year that he has a chance to really step up and try to make a name for himself in this Norvell offense that has made a lot of players into big name talents. This is definitely going to be kind of a, a wide receiving and an offense by committee, if you will. It's going to be a yeah. different guy, seems like, every game. Yeah, but the same thing is at the running back position, but running back position is just out of the fact that they have so much depth there. That's Demario nice. Richard is going to be the number one guy, but and he proved that in the Sun Bowl with four touchdowns. But Caleb Balazs is, is a great player. He's a linebacker playing running back. And the, so much fun. The guy who's been the surprise at the spring, at the spring camp is Deshavon Hayes, a.k.a. Gump, who's... <laughs> love it. Todd Graham said they're going to need to have stop signs in the student section to get him to stop running because he just breaks these big runs, and he just can't stop running. He's a great guy who redshirted last year. Sort of a hidden gem of this ASU offense right now. Get the stop signs with a double inferno coming yeah. next year, right? That, that'll be a lot of fun. And then, of course sort of the lesser side of ASU football and sort of the more serious side is Davon Durant will be arraigned tomorrow, to March 25th, as continuation of his case for assault and battery. Um, so what is your thoughts, Ben, on sort of how, how this has been lingering for ASU football? I don't think lingering is the right word. I think they're trying to get it open and shut, but it's just that you got to let the, uh, the process, you know, play its part because it's not a quick process in any means in this scenario. And... What I've liked is how swift they've been trying to just trying to move on. They've cut him immediately. They're not really wanting to talk about him. That kind of stuff is really good to see. But you talk about, say, you know, his girlfriend trying to recant her story and the 
claiming that the bruises weren't actually bruises from his hand. I, I just don't know what to believe at this point. We'll just have to let its process play out and then see what happens from there. Yeah, Todd Graham has done a great job. He's come out and said, if you're suspend if you're arrested, you're gonna get suspended indefinitely. That's team policy. He's strict been strict for that ever since he got hired. And he's handled this fairly well. It's just a matter of sort of the media trying to find out as much information as possible, which is doing its job, but still you have to let the justice system do its process. Mm -hmm. He's getting arraigned tomorrow. He has a court date. It just have to let the process handle itself, and we'll see if he, if Todd Graham is willing to let him work his way back onto the team once the pro if the process is handled that way. Yep. All right. Now we move on to another really good piece uh, that was put on the ASUDevils.com today uh, from writer Jordan Knight talking about ASU's kind of boycott against Grand Canyon University. Can you call it right away? It is. It, it, if they never played each other, what I'm waiting, I want the ASU GCU baseball to happen because that that'd be scary for ASU considering GCU beat U of A last season. But to the on the basketball court, yeah, it's not going to happen just because Michael Crow was really made a vendetta against GCU and loves saying it's a for-profit university. I don't want to face a for-profit university in, in Division One athletics. That should not be fair. What are your thoughts on it? I think a big thing it's it's about it's about what Crow's saying, but I think another thing is about this is that it's about having another person who's recruiting in your area, this area that you're already struggling in to try to retain your own talent, and then you have another coach, a big name coach in Dan Marley, and it's a program that has arguably better facilities in GCU, and a backing in Jerry Colangelo, who's very influential in the basketball community. You have that in your backyard when you're already sort of struggling to have a productive program on the floor. It's sort of intimidating, I think, for ASU, and I think they don't want to give a GCU the satisfaction of playing them. ASU really gains nothing by playing playing them, right? So it's really difficult situation to sort of figure out how that works for ASU and GCU to play. Uh, it's kind of Dan Marley said they want to be the next Gonzaga, the next Wichita State. In the Wichita State example, it with. KU not wanting to play them. I think it's the same thing with ASU. They have nothing to gain by playing GCU because they're still not quite at that level in the WAC right now. They're not really anywhere close. They finished 15 and 15 this year. They're in the CIT. It's just, it's just not enough to say, yeah, I really want to play you because you lose, which in all likelihood would happen with this team if you were in non-conference yeah. at the beginning of this year because it was so clumsy in the very beginning. Yeah. They would lose and it, ASU would be the laughing stock, but you win it like you were supposed to win. What's the big idea? So it's a lose-lose situation, I think, for ASU if they were to play GCU in the near future. It's like if ASU played Lehigh this year, they lost in triple overtime. Herb Sendai got ripped apart for that loss, and they deservingly so. But if that had happened in his own backyard, his recruiting in the state would be done. Yeah. He, you lost to a smaller in-state school. How are you going to rebound from that? So that's You need to make sure that you have a right program on the floor before you can really play a program like GCU. Well, now we go to the diamond now. ASU has won their first two Pac-12 series. They got it over Oregon State and Oregon, first at home and then on the road through the rain in Eugene, but it's kind of been who's going to step up. And one of the guys that has been stepping up is Colby Woodmancy. He had yeah. a big RBI on Saturday night. Ryan Kellogg, another complete game in the state of Oregon. But you look at this lineup, not many hits over the weekend, and the, the real fire starter, Johnny Seawall, the leadoff guy at the top of the order. Johnny he's, Baseball. He's four for his last 28. What do you think is going on with this ASU team as they get ready? How do they keep winning as they get ready to head into Stanford this weekend, or kind of welcome Stanford this weekend? Uh, I think this happens basically at this point almost every single season. You hit your slumps, especially early part in the season. You're starting to play conference opponents. So you're really starting to gear up to what you're actually going to look like later on in the season and come the postseason. So you're starting to try new things, and some things work, some things just don't. And I feel like Johnny Seabald's just in a slump. I think he'll break out of it. He's proven that he can be a good slump buster. And you still have those promising signs, right? You're still winning games. You won a, game, a series against a good Oregon team. You won a series against a really good Oregon State team, the defending conference champions. So you have the promising signs. You have Ryan Kellogg, who is pitching out of his mind. He threw a complete game, three hitter on Saturday night. You still have your bullpen is still performing well. Ryan Burr is still great as a closer. I, I'm still perfectly fine with this ASU baseball team going into the conference slate, the meat of their conference slate. I think they're, they'll turn things around. I think Tracy Smith has, is trying out new ways to fire up this team. I think he saw that on Twitter. 
uh, he encouraged Ryan Kellogg one night and then just completely threw his team under the bus hey. on Twitter. So, or so some say. Yeah, but I, think, I, I, I don't think it's anything. I, I think, don't think it is. I think it's a little bit overblown. I think Tracy Smith is known for his Twitter account, so he'll be using his Twitter account for sure. And he has proven that he will win or lose. And maybe this is his way of trying to light his fire under his team. I'm pretty sure he tried doing that in person in the locker room after the game. Maybe Probably. Twitter was a little added incentive in there. Like, hey, I yeah. might have to embarrass you a little bit so you can start... Improving a little bit. And follow us on Twitter too, right here, by the way. So go ahead and click that button and find yeah. our Twitter profiles there. You'll enjoy it. And then um, our last story of the day Devin Carr, former Sun Devil gang, signed to the Indianapolis Colts as part of the Veterans Combine. Now, I didn't know that existed until this week. It's, I don't know if it's working or not. We'll see. Devin Carr got signed. But the thing is, it's a situation where players have to pay $400 to participate. They can afford it. They can, if they have, but if they've been out of the league. For Come on. Years. Come They've on. been out of the league. They've paid their own transportation to get there. And honestly... These guys all bought, like, Benzes and BMWs with their signing bonuses. Come on. Yeah, they paid with their signing bonus. What do they have now? <laughs> I sure hope they had a financial advisor. I really do, too. But the, some of these guys have been out of the league for a while. You see guys like Michael Sam, who uh, tried latching on with the, with the Rams and the Cowboys last year. Couldn't quite... Brady Quinn, who was calling games for Fox this year, and now is a veteran's combine. I, it's just these guys who... Frankly, they've been out of the league, and they're going to be out of the league, even if they're in the veterans' combine. I don't think it really moves the needle for these veterans, and I don't know if it's really profitable. It's profitable for the NFL, that's for sure, but I don't think it really has much benefit to the players. Players are just clinging on to that last bit of hope, which I don't think there really is. Yeah, there's not much, but good for Devin Carr for trying, yeah. you know, proving that he could be a success story coming out of here of the veterans' combine. It, it will be interesting to see. You just have to let that unfold. There's a good piece on that as well here on ASUDevils.com. That's going to do it for us. This is it, the first one. If you like it, we hope you stay tuned. Every week we'll have something new, something to talk about, as sure we will. Yeah. Today was an easy day with Herb Sendak, but spring football is in full swing. Baseball has been going. Softball has been on a roll, too. We'll follow the run of women's basketball as well. Hey, and there's more hockey news been coming out about scheduling and everything yeah, about that. So we're playing a tournament next year. So. Plenty to talk about as this, the rest of the season and the rest of the offseason for football goes on. But with Bobby and Ardaya, I'm Dominic Catronio. Thanks for watching here on ASUDevils.com, and stay tuned for next week.